Hello, welcome to Stronger Together, Loving Your Spouse in a Chronic Illness. This is our third session as we are meeting uh, this month. There are four sessions in this particular series, and we are on session number three. And uh, really great to have you joining us. Uh, hopefully people are getting online and uh, we have a comment section there, the chat section. If you want to make a comment, kind of say hello, like uh, Lori has done. Hello, Lori. Uh, good to see you again tonight. You can just uh, just uh, say hello, maybe where you're uh, watching from. That would be helpful. That would be fine as well. We'd love to uh, do that. Also, uh, there is a handout for tonight, as there is for each of these sessions that we're doing this month. And you can see the uh, website where you can go and uh, download that. That's across the bottom of your screen there, williebatson.com. And uh, the, the easy way, just go williebatson.com. And when you get there, click on online courses and there'll be a drop down box and you just click on the loving your spouse in a chronic illness. Uh, if you don't have time to do that, you don't wanna leave your screen right now, no problem, don't worry about that. Uh, we're going to be putting things on the screen to help you and you can maybe jot down a few things on some scrap paper. But anyway, really great to have you uh, with us tonight. Uh, we're talking about loving your spouse in a chronic illness. And uh, one of the things that I've discovered over the years, and I've been working with married couples for uh, just about all of my adult life in pastoral ministry, as well as in coaching and counseling couples. And over the last 11 years, really working specifically with couples dealing with chronic illnesses in their marriage, doing some teaching, as well as living that experience. I'll share that in just a moment. But marriage and being a good spouse is sometimes difficult, especially when you're dealing with a chronic illness in marriage, uh, whether it's a physical, chronic illness, or emotional, or psychological, there's no doubt that in addition to all the other obstacles, normal obstacles and challenges that those in wedded bliss must face, a chronic illness or a serious disability can pose a hurdle that uh, some people find difficult to overcome. Uh, one of the things that I discovered because uh, my wife, Cindy, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and lived with it for 27 years. Uh, one of the things we discovered was that everything changes when a chronic illness comes into a marriage. Ideas of quality time, uh, the way that you communicate with each other, uh, what you even communicate about, you know, the subjects, the kind of things that you thought you would never talk about. Uh, chronic illness kind of brings that into the conversation. And uh, your thoughts about uh, equality or shared responsibilities in the relationship, how you spend your time and money, every aspect of the marriage may be impacted by the long-term illness of one of the spouses. That's why in our session tonight, we're going to be focusing on the unique challenges of a chronic illness marriage. Uh, Cindy and I lived that. Let me, uh, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with us. Oh, by the way, uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, I've written a couple of books that you can check out on my website. But uh, I want to show you a picture. I'll go here. Well, all right, let's go back. My, my slides are not in the order that my mind wants to talk. Uh, why don't we just check out? As I said, this is the third in our series of, um, of seminars, webinars that we've been doing on this particular topic. And you can see that we did uh, June 9th, How to Thrive in a Chronic Illness Marriage. June 16th, Courage and Hope in the Shadow of Alzheimer's. That was last week. We had a great conversation with Cynthia Fantasia. And both of those sessions, are they were recorded and they're available on my website, williebatson.com, at the uh, Loving Your Spouse Through a Chronic Illness Marriage page. So you can check that out. And tonight we're going to be uh, looking at facing the challenges of chronic illness marriage. And then next week will be the end of this series. And I'll be sharing three things you must do in a chronic illness marriage. Uh, in the past, I've called this a survival guide for a chronic illness marriage. So I hope you'll come and uh, come back and join me next week. And here's what the picture I was getting to. I wanted to show you a picture of my wife, Cindy. 
We were married 45 and a half years. She passed away from complications related to pneumonia and uh, really some complications related to her primary progressive multiple sclerosis. But she passed away in February of 2018. So it's been a little over two years ago. But we were married for 45 and a half years. And in those 45 and a half years, 27 of those, she was uh, diagnosed with MS and dealing with that. And uh, eventually got to the place where she uh, was not able to walk and needed a wheelchair. In fact, she fell and broke her hip, which kind of expedited the walking disability. But she uh, spent the last four or five years in this uh, power chair, which gave her a lot of freedom for getting around. And uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, Cindy was always uh, smiling, even in the challenges that she was dealing with, with her uh, primary progressive illness. And, uh, you know, just difficult. She was able to smile. Even uh, the many times that she was in the hospital, doctors and nurses would come in. And depending on how things were going, she would offer them a smile. And, and I, I was thinking about this the other day that uh, usually uh, every time one of the staff members would leave her room, she would just thank them, uh, which they all sometimes were kind of surprised by that. But uh, she uh, was a beautiful woman. We have uh, two children who are married, and we have six grandchildren. Uh, and I guess, needless to say, I do miss her, but uh, so grateful for the years that God gave us. And we learned a lot as we were dealing with the progression of her chronic illness. And God opened the door for us to, to be involved in a ministry, to initiate a marriage ministry called Stronger Together which focuses on helping couples uh, who are dealing with a chronic illness. And the verse that really accentuates that, um, that ministry is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Let me read it for you. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person fails, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Uh, and that's where the Stronger Together idea comes from. Well, tonight uh, we're going uh, to be talking about facing the unique challenges of a chronic illness marriage. And I'm very happy to have with me Mike and Donna Bassett, who live in uh, North Carolina. And uh, we have become friends over the last few months, uh, really didn't know each other. Uh, we, have, we have mutual friends, but our paths just didn't cross until I think... Um, Last fall, Mike called me and uh, we started talking about their journey and everything that's happening uh, with them. And we just kind of started connecting. And when I put this series together, I contacted Mike and Donna and asked them if they would be able be willing to consider uh, visiting with us here online and sharing how they're navigating the challenges of Donna's cancer diagnosis. Uh, Mike and Donna met uh, as uh, while they were students at Berkshire Institute for Christian Studies in Lenox, Massachusetts, uh, Donna's parents gave her one directive when they gave her the blessing to leave her home in North Carolina and go to school in New England, and that was don't bring home a Yankee. Well, it's a, uh, Mike says it's a good thing that she wasn't always so good at following directions. Uh, Mike was born and raised in Western Connecticut, and together they have served in uh, pastorates and ministry positions in Georgia, Florida, Virginia, and now for the last several years, uh, Eastern North Carolina is their home. They have four wonderful children ranging from ages 10 to 19. And so let me, uh, let me bring them, let me get uh, them on the screen here. Whoops, that's the wrong, there we go. All right, that's <laughs> the one that I want. <laughs> Hello, Mike and Donna. Hi. Good evening, Willie. Yeah, and uh, it's great to see you guys. And um, I really appreciate you uh, joining us here tonight and being willing to share your story. Uh, how is it there in North Carolina weather-wise? Hot. It's hot. Yeah, hot. Yeah. Very hot. hot. Somebody <laughs> said, uh, if you want to understand the weather in North Carolina, take a shower, don't towel off, and just put all your clothes on. And that's about it. That's about what we're experiencing right now. All right, the humidity. Yes. Uh, now, now, 
the thing that I want to comment about, uh, and we did this uh, before we went live, uh, for everybody that's watching, uh, remember in my introduction, I said that uh, Mike is from North, from Connecticut and Donna is from North Carolina. And uh, Donna from North Carolina went to New England to go to school and married Mike from Connecticut. Well, I am originally from North Carolina, lived in North Carolina. Many moons, many ages ago, I went to Massachusetts to go to school. Uh, really, uh, uh, not the same one they went to, but one that was there before uh, Berkshire Institute of Christian Studies, Berkshire Christian College, and met Cindy, who was from Connecticut. We got married, <laughs> and and it's uh, so it's kind of interesting. This is fun. Uh, and I told yeah. uh, Mike and Donna that my father said when I uh, told him that I uh, was planning on marrying a Connecticut Yankee, he said, can't you find a good Southern girl? <laughs> but uh, he he came to love Cindy dearly and she loved him too. And she was fully accepted into our family. So uh, it's good. Well, listen, uh, let's get started. Let's talk about, uh, you know, why we're here tonight. We're going to be looking at uh, some th some challenges, some uh, unique challenges, I think, for couples facing a chronic illness marriage. And so I think before we dive into those real quick, uh, perhaps maybe a little bit of background. Uh, first, how many years have you guys been married? 23. Yep. Just celebrated 23 in May. All right. Great. 23. Congratulations. 23 Thank years. You. And uh, it was interesting that to, I always, when I ask people how many years they've been married, I, I always watch who looks at whom and who's <laughs> going to give the answer. So, so I'm just going to let your answer because I was <laughs> scared. <laughs> that's, that, that's probably a safe, a safe bet there. So uh, Donna, uh, you were diagnosed with cancer uh, a little over seven years ago. Uh, give us a little bit of background. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. Okay, so uh, for years I had um, dealt with um, abnormal lesions on my skin, I should say. And I didn't know at the time, but I have two, not just one, but two, um, genetic mutations, but at first we just dealt with things on my skin, um, since I was pregnant with Isaac. So almost 20 years dealing with that. But around eight years ago, I got really, really sick. We were in Florida at the time and, uh, ended up in the hospital. And in the course of trying to figure out what was wrong, they discovered that I had a tumor, um, in my intestines and uh it turned out to be i was i was diagnosed with stage four metastatic malignant melanoma mm. and um that will be eight years um coming up in october that that happened so the blessing for me is that eight years out i i can sit here and talk about a chronic illness because if you had asked the doctors at the time they would have said traditionally i would have probably a year to 18 months from that diagnosis so it right. is by the grace of God that I sit here and I'm able to talk with you um, about his goodness to me um, tonight. So I, I got diagnosed almost eight years ago, had a, a surgery then. I had a recurrence uh, about seven months after that, another tumor, same issue, mm -hmm. another surgery. By that time, we lived in North Carolina. And um, after the second surgery, tumors reappeared in the same area, and they said we can't we can't do any more surgeries. It's not it's not helping. It's not working. Um, but we just so happened to have a clinical trial for the exact two mutations that you have, the genetic mutations that you have. So that was the summer of 2013, and I went on um, the first uh, clinical trial for for those medicines and they didn't work for a lot of people but they worked for me and the, mm. um they were able to to get me to um uh where i had no tumor no tumor burden so they eventually kicked me off of that trial they said you don't qualify because you don't have any more tumors <laughs> so I went off of that and um my tumor returned so then i went and tried a couple other therapies but ended up going back on that um same medicine combo which by then was approved wasn't a trial anymore and was on that for a couple years, had some harsh side effects. So we've had some ups and downs with it. Um, 
this past fall, I took another break because it was so tough and another tumor popped up. So we, uh, we went back on medicine this January, yeah. but it was a new blend of medicine. So, um, <clears throat> I felt really great on this new blend, but today was a big day for me because I had scans yeah. up today and we went to see if the new medicines were working. And the, the amazing news was my tumors were stable and or shrinking that I had. Yeah. And so I had um, no new lesions in my brain, no new anything anywhere else. And what I do have were stable and one was even smaller than it was in January. So the new meds are working <laughs> and um, I'm feeling really awesome. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So we're in a big day today. Yeah. Yeah. Big day today. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate you guys being on tonight, having, you know, knowing that today was going to be kind of a, not too sure what that day was going to be, yeah. how it was going to yeah. work out, but, uh, Praise God for that good uh, report that you got today. So um, let's talk about, in fact, I think maybe in the context of the first unique challenge that couples in a chronic illness marriage face is that uh, this, uh, this chronic illness is like a third wheel in the relationship. Uh, it can be like an annoying presence that you know is always getting in the way or interfering with plans and activities. Uh, so you know, that was kind of the, um, I guess I'd like to hear a little bit, and maybe Mike, uh, you could share just a little bit about now that uh, early on, early on in the diagnosis, uh, how did you respond as a spouse? Uh, I mean, we were both uh, shell-shocked. I mean, it was like a giant sucker punch. Uh, we uh, we actually candidated at the church that we're presently at and uh, went, went back to Florida where we were living after candidating up here. And uh, Donna was feeling anemic. And, and then we went uh, for outpatient checkup. They did some blood work and they called us the next day. They said, you need to get her to the ER. Um, mm. Hemoglobin was so low. And, uh, and then it just seemed like our world unraveled. And uh, it, it's like uh, the only thing I could imagery, I could think of a, like a boxer being in a boxing match and the opponent is just pummeling him and he just keeps, you know, kind of falling backwards and he doesn't have his footing. He's not graceful. He's not being able to do anything that he trained to do. And we were, we were just, you know, it was just, we were struggling and, um, uh, it, over the course of about a week, um, we discovered that she had metastatic uh, malignant melanoma. Um, she was hospitalized at the time, had a tube down her throat, um, didn't even want to talk to her family because she was uh, worried that the, you know, she'd start getting upset and then everything would tighten up around the tube. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm, I was, you know, running interference with family and, and just trying to, uh, limit the flow of information and, you know, that all unfolded. And, um, and so as we, as we talk prior to, uh, coming on, I, I, it's almost like two different stages of our life. And so the, 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 or the, the illness that in the, initially we were just reeling from the diagnosis and, and all the changes that it brought to our, our new reality. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I'll never forget a few years ago, we were sitting in the doctor's office and he said, uh, with the advancements in medicine and how well you're responding to it, um, you might uh, be in a whole new category. And we're going to call this a chronic condition. And she and I literally high fived each other. So <laughs> I don't know if you've ever interviewed anybody that was thankful uh, to get a chronic illness, but, uh, but, you know, uh, early on had its own set of struggles and, and we, we learned uh, through that. Um, yeah. And then, you know, living with long-term illness is, is a whole other uh, ball of wax. And, and um, uh, you know, Donna used a phrase is, is so happen. And, and we, we know that God is orchestrating things behind the scene. That's our, that's our worldview. Um, but, uh, but I, I would just say we saw so many evidences of, of his hand. And, um, mm. and that's all we can attribute it to. Um, we were in a, 
we were in a doctor's office. Uh, the, it was the oncologist that was, you know, uh, prescribed to us by the by the hospital that we were admitted to. And um, we we went into the oncologist's office one day after she got released from the hospital and he was ready to start her on this new, you know, this medicine. And and I remember asking him, I just wanted to know his prerogative for why he was choosing the medicine that he was choosing, because, you know, I really took seriously this this, you know, call to be her advocate and, yeah. and to look out for her. Um, and and, uh, you know, I had done some research and some studying. I wanted to be prepared uh, for the uh, the visit and and um, and we just this oncologist just got incensed and and he said to me he said uh, yeah when you get an MD after your name you can start asking me those questions and Don and I just looked at each other like is is this a candid camera show like is this really <laughs> happening and um I I um I gotta confess I said some things that um I wasn't proud of and uh, you know I I was incensed and and it was it was almost comical in retrospect how awful that visit went yeah but we walked out of that appointment it just so happened that morning we had made an appointment at moffitt cancer center in tampa which is one of the top melanoma centers on the east coast yeah and um, and and donna was able to start seeing an oncologist down there and one of the reasons he treated everything surgically initially is because he was really excited about some of the medical research that was coming down the pipe. And, uh, um, by the time we moved up here, uh, and, and Donna, um, we, we, we went to go talk to the guy at Moffitt and tell him, Hey, we're contemplating a move to North Carolina. And he said, Hey, no problem. I've trained two doctors, one's at uh, Duke and the other's at UNC. And he asked Donna, you know, what color blue do you bleed? And it's this color. <laughs> and, uh, and so, only that North Carolina thing. people are going to get that, I think. <laughs> and it just so happened that uh, after we got her established at UNC Hospital, that um, the oncologist that sees her now was overseeing uh, this this clinical trial. And one of the things they told us, and I'm, I'll move on, but one of the things they told us real, real early on uh, here at UNC, um, he said, if you had taken the first dose that that oncologist in, in, in Florida had prescribed for you, he said you would have been precluded from the trial. Wow. And so it was, it was almost like I attributed God's like, okay, Bassett, I'm, I'm not even going to let you get this wrong. This is, this is <laughs> how bad this is going to go. Um, but, you know, I think God used that to, uh, to get us out of there and, um, yeah. and to get us yeah. away from that advice. Yeah, and I think the uh, one of the things that I really appreciate there is your role as her advocate, and also uh, going in prepared. You know, I that was kind of way that I responded when Cindy was diagnosed with MS. I I did all kinds of research about it, and uh, and continued, and we continued to learn as much as we could about the advancement of dealing right. with it. But to uh, to recognize, um, I just can't believe the doctor said what he did, but, uh, you know, it, unfortunately, you know, but fortunately you guys got connected well. And, and I think that's that idea that even though this chronic illness is like a third wheel in the relationship, um, you know, it's something that you always have to be thinking about, maybe not always, but, you know, and we'll talk about it, maybe some of those, uh, as we move on here with some of the other challenges. But I think that, uh, for those who are watching, and listening, that really uh, what you guys uh, have done is that the best way to deal with this particular challenge is to focus on functioning as a team, to to not leave, you know, I, I think from a the standpoint of a spouse without the disease, uh, to be able to recognize, uh, okay, we're going to, I'm going to be involved in this, I'm going to come alongside I'm not going to let my spouse do this all by himself or herself. And uh, yeah. so the best way to deal with this new uh, third wheel in the relationship is to work together to adjust and adapt uh, while also watching out for those frustrations. Uh, why don't we uh, move on to the second one so we um, have time to get to all of these tonight. Uh, how about uh, the second challenge is that a chronic illness changes the rules in a relationship. Um, 
some people I've heard people say after they've received a diagnosis and, and sometimes even along the way, a diagnosis of a chronic illness that uh, their response has been, this is not the way life is supposed to be. You know, this was not um, on our planning list. And really that's a, I think that's probably a common reaction among couples whose daily, daily lives have been impacted by a chronic illness. Um, how have you guys dealt with the the way the rules have changed for you. You know, um, it may be that you had shared expectations and dreams that are now threatened by uh, the chronic illness. Um, how, how have you, how have you dealt with those changing rules? I, I wish I could tell you uh, flawlessly. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, there are times where, uh, you can be a little selfish. And as a caretaker, I think about how this affects me. And uh, 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 we're a ministry couple. And, um, you know, sometimes there are uh, things out in the community that I'm invited to or church functions. Um, and I've just grown so accustomed to having her by my side. And uh, one of the changes that this has introduced is uh, – she's not feeling well. There, there are, there are days sometimes where she just go down for the count. And, you know, initially that was, that was kind of a hard adjustment. And I, yeah. I remember, I remember going to a function and, 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 you know, like cognitively I knew it wasn't her fault, you know, but you do, I don't know if I articulated it, but you, you do end up saying to yourself, well, this isn't how it's supposed to be, you know, and, and, um, that, you know, there, there've been quite a few ball games, uh, you know, children's events, play practices, things like that, where at a moment's notice, I just got to be ready to, um, to just take the wheel and, and, yeah. um, and, um, you know, there, there've been times where I, you know, my empathy was not as, you know, well developed as it should have been, um, you you, you kind of can't help but think about how it affects you, um, that sort of thing. But um, and I think it's, you know, it, I think it's been tough for her too, um, you know, in a yeah, way. How, how, how would you speak, Donna? Yeah. Um, well, I, I thought I was thinking about this, and I wanted to share with you a quote. Um, it's from John Piper, and um, he's. He's really helped me. Um, some of his works. He has a book called "Don't Waste Your Cancer." I don't know if you've heard of that one. It's a little I book. Have it's heard. A book. But um, that kind of thinking has really blessed me. But this quote I wanted to share with you. He says, "Occasionally, weep deeply over the life you hoped would be, grieve the losses, then wash your face, trust God, and embrace the life you have." Mm. And that kind of was what we tried to do. Like it's okay to to regret that this isn't turning out like we thought it might turn out and it's okay to grieve the losses or to, to open up and be honest about what we thought would be or what our expectations were and how it's not always what we wanted, but then to go, okay, well let's make the best of what we have now, like the new rules. So a way we try to do that is on the days like today where we have so many scans and all this stuff and UNC for us is about an hour and a half away. So yeah. we change the rules in our favor and we make it a date day. And sometimes I don't feel very well, so it's not a very fun date necessarily, but on days like today we can go and we can eat and celebrate and just spend time, the two of us away from the kids, away from the church and, and, use that as, as a positive, whereas some people would see it as a, a miserable day being up yeah. and, and having tests, but we try to turn it into um, a date day and turn the rules in our favor. I think that's great. I love the uh, quote that you read and, and I, I grabbed the last part of that embrace the life you have. Uh, yeah. I, I think that is such a, a powerful thing to do when you're facing so many challenges, then, uh, you know, it's like, okay, it's not the life that we planned. It's not what I had in mind. Um, and, you know, when we get married, we make promises, the traditional vows for better, for worse in sickness and in health. And I remember making those promises 
1972 when I was just not even I was not even 21 years of age at that point. And you know, it's like I figured, well, when I'm in my 80s or 90s, I'll deal with some of that, you know, health, the, the sickness sort of stuff, not knowing right. it would come sooner than that. But I think that's yeah. a really great way to look at the rules changing, uh, to kind of have that Im- you know, embrace the life you have, make, make, well, even making memories, yeah. you know, with these trips, like you're, you know, going to the hospital, uh, but you're then making it a date day. And so you're really creating memories, new memories. That's great. Let's move on to the, um, to the next one, uh, which is uh, a chronic illness and in, introduces a level of of uncertainty into everyday life. And I think a lot of people who are dealing with a chronic illness certainly understand that. Uh, You may not be able to predict how you will be affected from morning to afternoon, uh, let alone from one month or a year to the next. Um, And and it's it's an unpredictability that leads many spouses to begin to wonder, you know, what is it that I can count on? Or like you were saying, Mike, you know, can I really count on Donna to be there when I need her? And Donna, I think the other thing might be, you know, can I count on Mike to be there when I need him? And so there's there's a level of uncertainty in everyday life that comes. How have you guys worked together as a team to confront uh, this particular challenge? Um, I think uh, we... We've we've learned to uh, j- kind of embrace uncertainty, if that makes sense. Uh, so it's almost like every day uh, she she kind of goes into a day with a plan A and a plan B. Um, yeah. So yeah. is this going to be the Donna that feels well, or is this going to be a bed day? <laughs> a bed day. Um, and uh, she's, you know. She's a mom of four. We we do um, homeschool. That's something that she has wanted to do through all this, and I think it has given her, you know, something to live for. And uh, but it, it also intru- introduces struggles. And uh, it's been a lot of days where she taught from the bed or a recliner, um, and and just done the best that she can. And yeah. uh, um, I think sometimes there's she needs to give herself a little more grace, and and she. She uh, she she can hold herself to a, a pretty high standard, and uh, and and uh, but you know you, you're just not you're just not dealing with uh, you know the the same the same set of cards that everybody else has at the table. If, if yeah. to use that analogy, but um, so I think what we've learned, like I was first diagnosed, I was 36. You know, and my babies were. Uh, 12, 9, 7, and 2. And mm. you kind of think, I'm, I'm going to have all these experiences with these kids. I'm going to see them grow up. And you kind of don't think about your own mortality necessarily every day. And then that my diagnosis changed all that. And so we stopped assuming that I have tomorrow. And I know none of us are promised tomorrow, but I have to live with it a little more present in my mind than most people, or at least than I did before. Yeah. And what it's really taught us is to really make the most of all the moments. We don't do it perfectly. I have bad days. I, 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 I struggle sometimes with feeling sorry for myself or this and that, but as a whole, we've learned to live so much more thankful for each little birthday or each trip to this or each Christmas or each um, grad, you know, the graduation. I got to see my son graduate last, last spring and didn't know if I would get to see that. And so I've cried all day because (laughs) it's so amazing that I, that I get to experience those things. And so I think it's taught us a really beautiful way to live. It's really just not taking anything for granted. And if I have a good day, we just try to make the most of that day. And we don't, we try not to look too far into the future. We just take mm. each day that comes good or bad. We've learned to take each day as a gift. It's not Disney. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. We, we were at Disney a few years ago and uh, our youngest daughter, it was her, first I think it was her time. first, first time at Disney. And uh, um, you know, as a dad, it's 
I mean, I, I like it, but, you know, let, let's just face it, you know, you, you pay this exorbitant amount of money and everything's overpriced and you're, you're hot, you're sweaty, you're walking around the park. And for all the money that you paid, uh, I don't know why you have to stand in the, you know, these incessantly long lines. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was, I was kind of getting caught up in that and I, and I could read it on other parents' face like that. You know, you get three quarters of the way through the day and I could just read it. They're like, my my fun meter is pegged. And uh, yep. I, I looked over at Donna and, you know, all day I'm just watching her and she's just beaming. Uh, she's grinning from ear to ear and uh, she's just relishing every second. And she she told me at one point during the day or after the day, she said, I didn't know if I was going to get to do this with Lydia. Mm. And uh the blessing of, of that, just that little blessing, it wasn't lost on her. And I saw the same look in her uh, when when Isaac graduated from high school. And um, yeah. he he uh, he's part of a, a group called Classical Conversations. And so he had a class that he walked with. We had a commencement address and everything. And, and Donna was just so, I mean, she was just thankful to the Lord and said, thank you for giving me um, this time. And it's not lost on us. Um, yeah. And it's a, that's a you know that's a really powerful way to live. It is, and I think when we were talking uh, last night, doing some prep about this, I think you used a phrase: um, "It altered our assumptions." And I've heard you say that tonight, I, and I think that's important for couples that are dealing with a chronic illness, whether it's cancer or some other chronic illness. Uh, chronic illnesses, they're, they're different ones and they impact our lives and our relationships differently. But um, uh, depending on what they are, this level of uncertainty into everyday life, not only uh, your ability to get through this particular day, but I, I really like the way that you talk about uh, not thinking not thinking too far into the future, you know, of recognizing, all right, I, I've been given this day, whether it's a good day or a bad day, you know, I'm going to deal with that. Uh, but you don't stop planning for the future, but it alters how you plan it. I think, I think um, planning for uncertainty is probably the surest way to feel more in control. Right. I, don't, I mean, that was the way that I felt, you know, with, when yeah. Cindy got to the place where uh, she was not able to, um, it was, it took longer for her to get ready in the morning to, to get out of bed, to get dressed, to eat you now because of the advancing of the disease, um, the difficulty in holding things with her hands, which MS will create numbness. And so, you know, we would have to be someplace and I would be all ready to go and she wasn't ready. And I'm just stressed out because, you know, we're going to be late. She's stressed out because I'm stressed out. We're saying things to each other. We shouldn't be saying to each other. And, uh, and we're, we, when we get to where we're going, sometimes it was a church function or, or a seminar to teach about marriage. Uh, you know, we were not, <laughs> We're, we're not in a very good, yeah, we're just not in a good mood. And right. uh, and so one of the things that uh, we decided to do to kind of manage that uncertainty a little bit was to get control of what we could. And uh, we figured out it, it, take, it would take her two hours to get ready in the morning. If we're going to leave to go somewhere, she needed, we needed two hours. Once we did that, and if we had, uh, we stopped getting early morning appointments, <laughs> we started making appointments that were reasonable. And then also, if we did need to be somewhere early, we knew that we needed to count backwards at least two hours. Uh, and once we did that, you know, the stress uh, was, you know, lowered quite a bit. Well, uh, a level, a ch chronic illness introduces a level of uncertainty into everyday life. But another challenge with a chronic illness is that it strains resources. Uh, and those resources can be, um, they're very valuable resources like money, emotional energy, and time. And when the illness or the disability uh, is allowed to strain the existing resources, people can, can be left with a number of emotions. They can feel overwhelmed, they can feel drained, uh, even resentful, resentful of their spouse, uh, particularly if other important needs go unmet. So 
um, to have a stronger together marriage, to be a stronger together couple with this particular um, challenge, I think it, uh, a, a healthy marriage strives best when both person's needs are recognized and important resources are shared or you, or you conserve the resources. Now, one of the things when, when we were talking about this, when I was talking about this with you guys, uh, Donna, you asked me if I had ever heard about the analogy of the spoons. Right. And I, and I had, so why don't you share that with everyone tonight? So in the course of, of my journey, it came to us about this spoon theory. And um, it was a woman who suffered with chronic illness. I think she had lupus. And she was trying to explain to her friend the difficulty of getting through the day with a chronic illness, that you can't do everything other people can or that you used to be able to do because you just don't have the energy that everybody else has. And so I think the story is they were in a diner and she looked around and she just grabbed out all the spoons. And she said, basically, this spoon represented a, an increment of energy, like how much energy. So you wake up and you have X amount of spoons, but it takes you this many spoons to get up and shower. It takes you this many spoons to walk the dog or to do the laundry. And so by the end of the day, someone with chronic illness has used up so many more of their spoons or they can't as easily replenish their spoons as someone else. And so when you start looking at it in terms of, okay, here's what we need to do today. But for me to do that, I, I have to choose between this activity or that activity because I know I'm not going to be able to have enough spoons to do everything. And when we were introduced to that concept, it gave us, um, it was such a tool because it gave us a common language because then I can mm. explain more easily. Okay. I understand that you want to do that and we need to do that. And the kids need to do that, but I have to choose because I don't have enough spoons. And it was like a light bulb. Oh, you know, I feel like it, it helped him to understand um, in a better way than any analogy that we had heard up to that point. Um, so I felt like it gave us that common language. Yeah. That, right. It put it, it was like a word picture in a way, and it put it in a way that I know it was a revelation for me because I was able to actually see um, in, in, a, in a way that I could appreciate how how finite uh, the resource of her strength is. And, um, you know, she can spend it on this. And uh, we, we talked yesterday, you know, I, I, could, I could gut it out and do something – you know, laborious or, or, or kind of, you know, some hard work. And, and I, I might go to bed early that, that night. And then, you know, tomorrow I'll, I'll wake up and, and, and I'll feel fine, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. But, you know, she might do it. And then for the next three days, she's, she's waking up in a, in a tremendous deficit. And, um, we've had some well-intentioned friends that, uh, have gotten on her, you know, at times just to say, Hey, you're overdoing it, that sort of thing. And, and, yeah. um, what they don't realize is she lives with an uncertainty of, I don't know which days I'm going to feel great and which days I'm going to feel terrible. And so there's a, there's a lot of times where, you know, you strike while the iron's hot. So if, if she's feeling great on a given day, she'll, she'll do maybe too much, but, you know, part of that is just living with the uncertainty. Well, I don't know how I'm going to feel tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah. it's just a new normal for us. Yeah. So I, I think that what I'm hearing from you guys is that uh, you're paying attention to the things that are important. You're paying attention to uh, the fact that you only have a certain amount of resources. So you really have to kind of budget them. You have to yeah. think through, you have to plan, which really is the same thing with, with money. You know, you only have a, at least most of us only have a limited amount of money. <laughs> and, uh, and so you have to make choices. Uh, you have to make decisions about, you know, what's the best, you know, use of the funds that we have. Uh, and, and the same thing with your emotional energy and also the same thing with time. But it certainly does change some of the rules or it really does strain a chronic illness will strain resources. And I, I have heard from a lot of people, you know, who struggle financially um, because of e either they don't have adequate health coverage, uh, health insurance coverage or care. Um, 
and 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 they're just doing the best they can. Um, so you know, uh, there may not be a. I mean, the answer for different couple, it's going to be a different answer for different people. But I I really do think when it comes to the energy level, I like the spoon theory. Cindy read about that and told me about it, and we started sharing it with people, and they just went, "Wow, you know that? Okay, that really helps understand." Yeah. And I think that can take some stress out of the marriage relationship if the, the well spouse, the spouse, uh, you know, without the chronic illness begins to understand, okay, I need to make some adjustments, uh, not yeah. just not just with my expectations, but with my, my whole thinking about my spouse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's, um, and let's move on to the next one. And that is uh, that a chronic illness can interfere with uh, roles and responsibilities. Uh, in most marriages, spouses tend to split up the jobs and responsibilities that keep everyday life on track. Uh, but that can become difficult depending on the chronic illness and, and what's happening. Uh, I think I've learned that the trick to maintaining balance in your marriage partnership is to make sure that uh, you're 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 doing what you can. Uh, you're uh, I, one of the things that I had to watch out for as the caregiver, as Cindy's caregiver and advocate. I had to watch out uh, that I would not take control, that I would not take over. And I have I have those issues anyway. <laughs> I have those control tendencies, and so I would always have to remember. Uh, okay. Cindy needs to have some input here. You know, she, for instance, the last nine months that uh, she was alive because of the, um, and I'm pointing to my neck, but because of uh, the advance of the MS, it affected her swallowing muscles. So she would uh, aspirate into her lungs. She would get pneumonia. She'd be hospitalized. So eventually the doctor said, you cannot eat or drink anything uh, by mouth. And she had a trach uh, to help clear her, her breathing. And also she had a feeding tube in order for nourishment. So for nine months, she was not able to eat or drink anything. And uh, uh, one of the things that she wanted to continue doing, uh, she started teaching me how to cook some stuff, how to fix my own meals. Uh, she'd already started doing some of that. But she planned the menu which was something that she did before when she was eating with me. She she planned the menu, the shopping list, all of that. And she continued to do that, even though she was not able to eat any of that, uh, which I thought, okay. You know, I told her, Cindy, I really feel badly that you're having to, you know, plan this, but you can't. She said, I want to do it. It's so it's important. Uh, to continue some of those roles and responsibilities. Um, Last night when we were talking about this, uh, you guys said this was really the toughest of the challenges so far, toughest for you. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Let's go on a number six. <laughs> and, and we and we we're running out of time, so you're gonna have to. <laughs> <laughs> we should have done this one first. <laughs> This is the tricky one for us, and um, we're still working on it. We're a work yeah. in progress, um, but we've we've um, had some moments where I, I go down for the count, and I usually I kind of run the show. You know, I handle things at home, and um, I have the kids, and I teach them, and we have dogs, and everybody is kind of making a mess. And when I go down usually those things tend to pile up in my absence. Yeah. And so when I do feel better, I am confronted with more than I'd like to see when I come out. And although it makes me feel needed, um, it also makes me feel a little overwhelmed. And so we're working on it. But one of the things I wanted to say is that we've um, really benefited in a lot of the, these areas, including this one, um, by by some really great counseling that we've been going to. And mm. so I wanted to, to advocate that if, if um, anybody um, feels the need, I, I would just try to take the stigma away from going to get counseling because it's been a great blessing to me and to the two of us um, to be able to have another person to kind of 
bounce things off of or kind of mediate a little bit and or, or pose a question to help us see things from the other person's perspective or open our eyes to something we may be missing in the heat of the moment at home. And so if we have issues like this where we just don't understand how the other person works, um, yeah. she steps in and really we've benefited from from having um, counsel on things like that. The objective party. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. What'd you say? I said the the objective third party, and oh, yeah. uh, they're they're uh, uh, and you know one of the things that we talked about um, last night as we were talking over things. Yeah, you know, I told you uh, 15 years ago I would not have agreed to see a counselor. Uh, Ten years ago, I probably wouldn't have admitted it. Uh, I, I wouldn't have been comfortable telling anybody. Um, and then, you know, the last few years, I've, I've started to speak a lot more freely about it because it's been it's been a huge help uh, to us. And, um, you know, one of the one of the first times we were in with our, our current counselor, she said, guys, look at all you're having to deal with. I mean, you have you're facing things that most couples never have to deal with. And she said no. a, a lot of people, when they get in your situation, um, you know, it, it doesn't make the problems in your marriage go away. It just, it almost shines a, a light on them. They, they're, yeah. they're amplified. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she's like, you're doing the right thing, you know? And, and, um, I love what she said. It's given us a common language. So mm. you begin to learn to speak each other's language. Um, mm. we're understanding more and more each day how the other one's brain works, um, our approach to life, our needs and wants and, and, and desires and that sort of thing. And, um, and I think a lot of those gains have come through, uh, through counseling and, and through just, you open know, communication. open communication. Yeah. 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 Which, uh, which is our next one is that uh, <laughs> <laughs> chronic illness can make communication difficult. But uh, I, before we, I mean, we'll, we'll blend, we can kind of blend this in. So, you know, the counseling has helped you guys have a common language to understand each other better and probably has uh, helped you deal with some of the difficulties that can arise from communication. Uh, when I first started working uh, or focusing our Stronger Together ministry on uh, couples with a chronic illness. I there's not a whole lot of research. I, I don't know about now. I haven't really seen too much. But back then, 11 years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of research about the impact of chronic illness on a marriage relationship. Uh, but one study that I did see, uh, a national su study, was that uh, the divorce rate is higher among couples with a chronic illness. Uh, than it is with those without. And one of the things that, I, and I think Mike, you might've been the one mentioned it. Um, and if Donna, you were the one, excuse me if I've forgotten, but the the idea is that, my, my thinking is that the uh, chronic illness exacerbates any broken areas of the relationship, any cracks in the foundation. Um, it may be that uh, things are going along fine. You're maintaining uh, with the issues that you're dealing with, but then you bring the stress of a chronic illness and the changes and the challenges that we've been talking about here. And then any cracks in the relationship are going like you, I think Mike, you, you know, they're bigger. Um, so I, I think that's a good point to make and also to uh, emphasize that maybe to have some counseling uh, marriage counseling or even individual counseling yeah. to help you navigate and learn how to speak a common language. Uh, anything else you would add to the to this challenge about communication in terms of how you can? And I think that you know it. The art of communication in a chronic illness marriage, uh, in some ways, can boil down to a couple of things, and that is uh, knowing when to talk and when to listen. Yeah. Yeah, which, definitely. Which and is true. No, I'm sorry. sorry. The way, which is Speaking true for that, any relationship. <laughs> 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 yeah. and, and the second one, when to start a discussion and when to keep quiet. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Uh, we we'll blame it on 
latency <laughs> and the internet. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Donna, what were you going to say? I was just going to add that um, we use humor a lot to break the tension. Uh, yeah. For point in case, um, you know, a joyful heart is good medicine, and I think that a lot of times we we um, try to inject humor where we can to uh, soften the the tough spots and and just be open in our communication and learn to laugh yeah. at ourselves. Yeah. That's this is going to sound weird. I'm going to make a confession for us. Uh -oh. Um. With with uh, with Pandora or Spotify, uh, we've been able to develop a uh, a station that has clean comedy. That you know we've dialed in, and you just thumbs down anytime something <laughs> objectionable comes on. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot of nights where she and I will will lay in bed and we'll listen to it for a few minutes before we fall asleep and and sometimes we'll just sit there and giggle and laugh <laughs> and it, it, it's a great way to end the day i mean just yeah i'm learning to laugh at yourself is so important and uh and it you know sometimes laughing at ourselves we it keeps us from crying <laughs> so that's you know, true really, that's true yeah humor yeah. is a good way to deal with it so you know before we leave this top uh, challenge and get to the last one uh I just want to add that finding ways to talk openly about these challenges is really the first step toward effective problem solving and and also the uh, continuing or maybe even developing the closeness that you can have you know that that open communication the common language um, humor all of those things I think uh, are very helpful in in dealing with this particular challenge. So let's look at the, the last one that we're going to focus on tonight is uh, that chronic illness can interfere directly and indirectly with sexual function. Wouldn't you know, I would leave that one for the end. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, but uh, this is this is one of the areas that um, people don't talk about, talk about communication. This is one of the areas when you're dealing with a chronic illness that many people are embarrassed to even bring up to their doctor or if they're in counseling uh, to even mention to the counselor, much less mention to, um, you know, uh, there's, well, sometimes even spouses don't talk about it. They're not, they're not talking about the issues that are going on. There are a lot of resources for help and support uh, in this area. And I, I think, uh, Talking to your primary care physician can certainly start the process of identifying some source of problems. Uh, the doctors, uh, most of them, I think, are going to be comfortable. If you have a doctor that doesn't seem to be comfortable, ask him or her, is there someone in your practice that you could, you know, we could talk to or that you could uh, refer us to? And I think one of the other things to keep in mind, this was something I learned along the way. Cindy was dealing with chronic pain. And uh, from the from the very beginning, when she was diagnosed with MS, she was on medication to uh, help her manage her pain. And so I, we learned along the way that uh, sometimes your lack of desire or even some of the challenges that uh, you may have in terms of performance when you're making love uh, that you didn't have before, you know, you didn't have those challenges before, but now maybe you do. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, it can be the fault of medication. Uh, they don't always tell you that. Um, and if you take the time to read all of the small print that comes with your prescription, you know, you might see that there. But I think that's one of the things I want to get out on the table here to uh, for couples who are watching us tonight, who may be struggling in this area. Uh, it can uh, a chronic illness can interfere directly, and that that may be as a result of some physical challenges, pain, uh, uh, lack of energy, but it also can indirectly affect sexual function, and that would be more of the psychological aspect in terms of how you view yourself, how you view your spouse. Um, but I... Um, more often than not, the person with the chronic illness has to be the one to bring it up, to bring up the subject with the staff. But I also think it's good for a husband and wife to kind of talk about this um, in that, you know, it, again, I've, I've talked with some couples where 
if the if the spouse with the illness, the chronic illness, is not as interested as he or she used to be, the the other spouse can begin to feel that there's uh, a lack of desire. You know that maybe it's their fault, or you know their their spouse is not interested or doesn't love them anymore. And that's why I think it's important to recognize it may be the chronic illness, it may be medication, it may be pain, it may be all kinds of other things other than your spouse's desire and love for you. Those are oh, yeah. some of my thoughts. How about you guys? Any any thoughts here you want to share? I was just going to say, it's another area where I, I, I just go back to open communication and just being honest. Thankfully, I have care providers and a counselor who both ask me straight up. I mean, we'll talk mm. about it. And, and we have a relationship where we pretty much talk about anything and everything that comes, you know, to mind or we deal with. And so I just say open communication um, is, is huge in, in that area as well. Yeah. We, you know, we were, we were just in the oncologist's office today and, uh, and we were, you know, we're sharing how she's felt with this new formulation of her medicine versus yeah. her old formulation. And uh, one of the, one of the, one of the differences is on her old formulation. It, it, it hit her so hard uh, physically that she, um, she, she had to take prednisone a lot of times. And mm. that's one of the most off prescribed medicines to anybody that has a, a chronic condition. Yep. There's a lot of people on a steroid, uh, prednisone, something like that. And yep. um, I, until, until I had a spouse that took it, I, you know, I would have never guessed what a mind altering, uh, mood altering substance, something as common as prednisone could be. So, I mean, you know, it just really points out uh, cancer drugs, um, you know, uh, any kind of uh, anything uh, dealing with, you know, musculoskeletal uh, uh, nerves, anything like that. I mean, the, a lot of these drugs are, they're just really powerful chemicals and they can, they can, they can alter your, your, your physical makeup and they can also um, alter your, your mental makeup. So yeah. Um, yeah. what, a, what another reason to check in with a counselor, um, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, we, we have, we have access to a counselor and a um, psychiatrist and, and, and so those folks, um, you know, they, they understand in better ways, you know, sometimes you're a, a psychiatrist might understand how prednisone is affecting you more than an oncologist. And yeah. uh, so, yeah. so I would, I just encourage people to take full advantage of the, the doctors at their disposal. Um, yeah. And, uh, one of the yeah. things I said in the first session that I did, uh, on, in this series was that knowledge is power. And so the more knowledge that you can have as a couple, you know, both of you getting as much knowledge as possible about the chronic illness and its effect and uh, on your relationship and how you can improve it, the better. Uh, it can be scary, you know, and don't believe everything you read on the Internet. Make sure you have good. Yeah. Make sure you have good sources for that. Just because it's on the Internet doesn't mean it's true or on Facebook, you know, on social media. Uh, but uh, this is an area that um, I think this is one of those areas going back to what you said, Donna, uh, you know, the quote from John Piper, embrace the life you have. And so, mm -hmm. you know, even in this area of your relationship, uh, it may not be what it used to be or what you thought it would be, but you embrace what it can be mm -hmm. and what it is and find mm -hmm. ways to stay connected with each other. Uh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually as well. Well, we've come, uh, we're past our time, our our set time, which is not unusual. This is, I've been, I've been doing this stuff now. Uh, I've been doing online stuff on a weekly basis since the end of March. And, uh, you know, so it's not unusual when you get into some of these conversations uh, to kind of go, go past. But I do want to be respectful of people's uh, time uh, that have been with us here tonight. And we've had some comments uh, that have come from various people uh, just, uh, just um, I guess, affirming uh, what you guys have been saying, especially the uh, openness to counseling. Uh, Bethany Dean Melton. Hi, Bethany. Good, good to see you. 
Yeah, good to see you on here with us tonight. And uh, she says, uh, being open to counseling, thank you for that message. Uh, that was good. And Lori uh, loved the spoon analogy. She can relate to that. Uh, and a uh, number of people, we got Lori from Upper Michigan. Uh, Lori's been uh, on these before, so that's good. So anyway, appreciate all of you who have been uh, a part of this. If you want to make any other comments, this video uh, is going to continue to be uh, the recording. It's going to be on Facebook. You'll continue to be able to add comments. If you have any questions uh, that you would like to ask uh, of Mike or Donna or even me, you can uh, do that. In fact, if you want to send me, if you have a question for Mike and Donna, you can contact me. Send, uh, Go to my website, to the contact page, and just, uh, just say you want this is for Donna or this is for Mike or for both of them, and I will forward it on to them and they can answer it. Or you can ask the question in the comment section if you, want, if you don't mind a public answer. Uh, but uh, if you prefer something more private, just get in touch with me. Uh, Mike and Don, I want you to uh, hang on there. Uh, after we go off, after I end the broadcast, I want to continue talking with you guys uh, for just a little while. So just, just, just hang in there. Don't leave uh, the studio at this point yet. So let me talk about uh, real quick about next week. Let me get to the uh, slide. Whoops, there we go. Uh, bring the slide up. So next week, uh, I'm going to be here by myself unless I unless somebody decides to drop in on me. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about three things you must do. Uh, that'll be next Tuesday, June 30th at 8 o'clock. That'll be the last in our series uh, that we will be doing on Stronger Together, Loving Your Spouse Through a Chronic Illness. So I hope you'll uh, join me for that. And again, uh, Donna and Mike, thank you so much for being a part of this, being willing to share, and maybe we can do this again sometime. And uh, when I come down to North Carolina to visit family, we're going to have to, you're going to have to take me to a barbecue place. Uh, <laughs> I, I, at Easter, Eastern North Carolina, we're going to, that's the best barbecue in the world. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're going to have to, we're going to have to get together uh, when Absolutely. I'm down there. So, And if you ever... And if you ever come up this way, let me know. Uh, okay. I'll try to connect. All right. Uh, I'll leave like you to... with one exchange that we had um, right yeah. before we came on. She said, "Oh, why did we? Why are we doing this?" You know, because <laughs> nerves, nerves set in. But uh, but I said to her, I said, you know, I was talking to the Lord this morning, and I said, Lord, if you just give her a good scans today. You know, we're we'll be careful to use this for your glory, and uh, yes. you know that's been our that's been our promise to him all along, yeah. and and he's good, and he's he's the reason he we're good. Uh, we're together, we're doing well uh, in spite of all this, uh, and uh, and and we just uh, we just want to uh, just praise him because he's he's just been so instrumental Absolutely. in uh, in yeah. keeping us from falling apart. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> he's been good to us. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, I appreciate that word and I agree with you. I think the important thing uh, that I'm seeing and hearing is that both of you are on the same page when it comes to trusting the Lord uh, and, and recognizing that your faith is foundational, not only to the health of your marriage, but to the health of your marriage with a chronic illness. And right. something that my doctor son-in-law has uh, ha told me a few years ago uh, when we first started focusing on Stronger Together, he said that, uh, you know, my, my focus is on how the chronic illness affects the marriage. But he did a couple of workshops with me where he said the, uh, the condition of the marriage or the stress of the marriage relationship can affect the chronic illness. Yeah. And, and that's why it's so important for us to be uh, as couples where there's a chronic illness in play, for us to be focused on good relationship, good solid relationship skills, uh, and that will that can have a positive impact on the chronic illness as well. Uh, so faith and and a commitment to be a team and work through this together. I see that with you guys. Uh, good model. Hopefully that encourages. Hopefully that encourages other people, not discourages, but encourage the, encourages sure. them. Sure. So again, uh, to all of you who are watching, uh, thank you again for being a part of this tonight. 
Uh, appreciate any comments uh, that you want to make uh, in the in the the um, chat, the comment section there to help us out. And again, uh, we'll see you next week. Let me close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've had together. I, I thank you for Mike and Donna and for the blessing that they are to so many people and the, their willingness to share here tonight. And I thank you that uh, you are the one who sustains us and uh, through a, the various storms of life. I pray for those who are watching us tonight, who um, I pray that they would be encouraged. I pray for those who are in challenging uh, illnesses as well as challenging relationships that uh, they'll be able to gain hope and encouragement for, from you and that uh, their marriages can be strong. They can be stronger together, building a, a, a marriage that honors you and one that is an encouragement to them. I pray for any relationships that need to be healed, that you would, in the name of Jesus, uh, bring healing to those relationships. And uh, again, thank you for this time that we've had together here tonight. Uh, may, we, may we be blessed with your presence, with strength and courage as we continue to move through our days. And thank you for the good word that Donna received from the oncologist today. And I pray that you would continue to uh, bring healing to her body, continue to give her strength for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. All right, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.